This is Bone Chillers to disturb your dreams. Dare to join us? Click subscribe. Ring the bell. But remember, we cannot guarantee your safety from the nightmares that await. Prepare to be thrilled, chilled, and filled with a sense of dread you'll find nowhere else. Welcome to the darkness. We've been waiting. The Bone Marsh. Dr. Alice Henderson had always been drawn to the inexplicable and the uncanny. So, when she moved to a small town in Louisiana and heard whispers of the Marsh of Clay Men, she felt a thrill of fascination. The tales spoke of pale, sinewy figures that rose from the marsh and dragged the rondels to their brackish depths. The townsfolk said that when the moon was just a silver sliver in the sky, the clay men would arise, their bones creaking like dry branches in the wind. They were the guardians of the marsh, a sort of spectral justice for the wicked. Alice, armed with her cameras, audio recorders, an insatiable curiosity, decided to investigate the bone marsh. But the locals balked at her interest. Old Mrs. Boudreau spat on the ground at her feet and warned her against meddling with things she didn't understand. Alice was taken aback but not deterred. The hostility only confirmed there was something to be discovered. The first time she ventured into the marsh, she felt a chill crawl up her spine. There was an eeriness, a silence that was too quiet. The stillness of the water was broken only by the occasional plop of a fish or the rustling of tall reeds in the breeze. She set up her equipment on the edge of the marsh and waited. When night fell, the marsh seemed to change. Alice could hear the croaking of the bullfrogs, the sighing of the swamp. It was then that she saw them for the first time, figures rising from the marsh. Tall, bone-thin, and covered in mud, they looked exactly like the tales described. But instead of feeling fear, Alice felt a scientific excitement. She tried to approach them, but they slipped back into the marsh, leaving only ripples as evidence of their existence. Over the next weeks, Alice ventured into the marsh every night. Her presence was no longer a surprise to the clay men. They allowed her to come closer, so close that she could see the individual lumps of mud and clay on their bodies, the dried marsh reeds that looked like rib bones. But every time she tried to touch them, they vanished into the marsh. One evening, as Alice was returning home from her investigation, she found a bone-white marsh reed outside her doorstep. When she picked it up, it crumbled into dust. An unsettling feeling of dread crept over her. She remembered Mrs. Boudreaux's warnings and for the first time, felt the stirrings of fear. The occurrences escalated. She would wake up to find her bed surrounded by marsh mud, reeds under her pillow, her house filled with the sound of creaking bones. Then one night, she woke up to find herself not in her bed, but at the edge of the marsh, the pale figures of the clay men looking down at her. Suddenly, Alice realized she was no longer the investigator but the subject. The clay men were not simple specters but ancient sentinels, awakened by her intrusive curiosity. They had become the wrongdoer, and they were out to claim her. Panic welled up inside her, but Alice was a scientist, a fighter. She tried reasoning with them, pleaded, but their hollow eyes stared back at her, unblinking. She felt herself being drawn into the marsh, her boots sinking into the mire, her knees, then her waist. Alice screamed, the terror finally breaking through her scientific demeanor. Just when she thought she was about to disappear into the marsh, she felt a strong hand grab her arm. Mrs. Boudreaux, with several townsfolk, had come to her rescue. They dragged her out of the marsh, away from the grasping hands of the clay men. Alice left the town the next day, the clay men and the bone marsh a chilling memory. But every now and then, she would find a bone white marsh reed at her doorstep, reminding her of the thin line between the known and the unknown, and the consequences of crossing it. Emma at night. The incandescent lights flickered ominously as Emily stood at the entrance to the subway. Her heart throbbed in sync with the pulsing buzz of electricity in the New York underbelly. She was no stranger to these cold, cavernous tunnels, but tonight, she could feel a chilling presence. An echo of the past. An echo of her sister, Emma. Emma, who vanished without a trace several years ago. Emma, whose laughter once bounced off these very walls. Now, only her ghostly echoes lingered, 
whispering secrets only Emily, with her empathic abilities, could understand. Emily stepped onto the platform, letting the flurry of city life wash over her. But the strange phenomena that had begun weeks prior were becoming more pronounced. Trains were mysteriously derailed, the signals malfunctioned, and whispers of a ghostly woman in the tunnels spread like wildfire. Emily knew it was no mere coincidence. It was Emma, reaching out to her. The lights flickered again, and Emily moved instinctively towards the infamous Line 13. An urban legend surrounded this line, that it was cursed, the playground of vengeful spirits. No one knew what instigated the law. Emma, however, was fascinated with it. Now, it seemed, Emma had become a part of the legend herself. As Emily made her way through the labyrinthine tunnels, the air grew colder. The city's chaotic rhythm dwindled into an eerie silence, and she could hear Emma's whispers more clearly. Images, like decrypted fragments of a broken memory, flashed before her eyes, a blood-red graffiti tag, a cracked green tile, and the sound of a distant, haunting lullaby. Each message led her further into the darkness, each one a breadcrumb on the path to uncovering the dreadful secret. With a gasp of revelation, Emily stumbled upon the graffiti tag. A single name was scrawled in jagged letters, Lara. Lara, their abusive aunt who vanished the same night as Emma. Emily's blood ran cold as the pieces started falling into place. As she followed the whispers to the cracked green tile, she noticed something lodged within it. It was a locket, identical to the one Emma wore every day. Emily's hands trembled as she pried it open, revealing a haunting picture of Lara, her eyes staring blankly back. In a rush, the horrifying truth began to reveal itself. Emma had discovered something about Lara, something terrible. Had Lara silenced her for good? The chilling lullaby grew louder in Emily's ears, a desperate plea for help from beyond the grave. Driven by the growing connection to her sister's spirit, Emily was led to the end of the Line 13. In the dim light, she saw a sealed-off tunnel. The lullaby was louder here, almost unbearable. Summoning her courage, she broke through the barricade and stepped into the darkness beyond. Her flashlight illuminated a haunting tableau, the skeletal remains of Lara, a knife in her ribcage, and beside her, a small eerily familiar skeleton clutching a locket. Tears streamed down Emily's face. Emma. She'd been here all along, her final resting place the eerie line 13. The lullaby ceased, replaced by a deafening silence. In the cold darkness, Emily felt a spectral hand on her shoulder. A sense of gratitude and peace washed over her. It was Emma, finally free from her torment. With a deep sigh of relief, Emily whispered her goodbye into the echoing tunnels, knowing her sister had found the rest she'd been denied in life. However, a chilling new realization dawned upon her. Lara, the abusive figure from their past, the instigator of this twisted tale, was also trapped here. Emily's breath hitched as the lights flickered violently once again. The echoes grew louder, but this time they were not Emma's. Cursed Line 13 had a new ghostly inhabitant. And Emily, drawn to these tunnels by empathy and love, knew she was the only one who could put an end to this spectral terror. Armed with the truth of her sister's fate, Emily ventured deeper into the haunted darkness, preparing herself to confront her own fears, and to face the spirit of the monster that Lara had been. It seemed, after all, Emily's journey through these echoing tracks was far from over. Snowblind, Erica Wright, a devoted environmental activist, was known by the people of Banff as the guardian of the Canadian Rockies. She loved the snow-capped mountains, the piercing cold winds, and even the soul-numbing frost. But nothing rivaled the enchanting creature she had discovered a beast made entirely of ice and snow. The entity was majestic, standing taller than a grizzly, its body glittering like an amalgamation of icy crystals, sculpted into a magnificent form. Erica was mesmerized. She believed it to be a guardian spirit, a protector of the pristine peaks. Her heart pounded with strange affection every time she glanced at it. As time went on, the town of Banff grew eerily silent. People began disappearing, all in strangely similar circumstances, snowy walks or hikes that ended in blood-streaked patches of untouched snow. Nobodies, 
just frost-tinged crimson sprinkling the pure white landscape. These incidents sent a shiver down the spine of the town, but Erica's fascination with the creature blinded her to the gruesome occurrences. Her closest friend, Natalie, was the next to disappear. Natalie had left for a snowshoeing trip and hadn't returned. Erica felt the sting of panic as the search parties returned empty-handed, their eyes haunted. She retreated into the mountains, the silence of the snowy landscape echoing her inner turmoil. Approaching the creature's den, a cavern of ice, she was greeted with its crystalline gaze. The affection in her heart throbbed again, drawing her closer, its beauty overpowering her. But something on the ground caught her eye, a bright speck against the blinding white. It was a brooch, one she had given Natalie on her last birthday. She picked it up, her mind struggling to piece together the disturbing possibility. The snow below her was stained a sickening red, partially covered by fresh snowfall. Her heart clenched as the creature watched her, its icy blue eyes seemingly cold and emotionless. The realization struck her like a blow. She staggered back, her mind flashing through all the disappearances, the eerie snow-related accidents, her missing loved ones. They had all ended up here, their fate intertwined with her affection for this frosty entity. The creature she had thought was a guardian, a protector, was a predator, hunting down the town, her friends, her family. Tears streamed down her face, freezing in the biting cold. The creature moved towards her, its form a shimmering spectacle in the faint moonlight. Erica was torn. She loved this creature, this entity of snow and ice, yet it had taken so much from her. Its existence was a paradox, beautiful yet horrifying, an enchanting terror. It was a part of the mountains she loved, yet a destroyer of her world. Why, she whispered into the frigid wind, her voice barely a whimper. The creature stood before her, its gaze unchanging. She felt the cold seep into her, numbing her. But it wasn't the chill of the air, it was the chilling realization of her misplaced affection. With a heavy heart, Erica knew what she had to do. She couldn't let her love for the creature blind her to the terror it brought. The mountains she loved had turned into a killing field. She had to protect her home, even if it meant destroying a part of it. A week later, Erica walked into town. She was changed, her once bright eyes now hard and haunted. But there was a determination in her stride. The townsfolk noticed the creature's absence. Erica told them it was gone, not mentioning the sleepless nights she spent luring the creature into a trap, her heart shattering with each step. In the end, Erica had to sacrifice her snowblind affection to protect her loved ones. She lost a part of her heart to the frosty mountains, but she gained the courage to face horrifying realities. Her love for the snowy entity became a chilling memory, a reminder of the deceptive beauty of nature and the thin ice upon which human life balances. The snowblind affection became a chilling tale in the frosty Canadian Rockies, echoing the haunting truth of love's blindness. Strings of the Past in the sleepy farming town of Cedar Hollow, time seemed to stand still, but the arrival of the mysterious man stirred the dust of time. He was an oddity, clothed in a suit as black as the night, his face obscured by a wide-brimmed hat. His sole companion was a puppet, its head a skeletal grin, its body a twisted entanglement of gnarled vines. Every full moon, as the townsfolk huddled in their homes, the man ventured to the center of the town's sprawling wheat field. There, lit by the luminescent moonlight, he would perform a puppet show. His audience? No one and everyone, the whispering wheat, the rustling leaves, the wide, watchful moon, and the curious town inhabitants who peered from behind the safety of drawn curtains. The puppet moved without any visible strings, as if possessed by an unseen spirit. Each performance was a macabre retelling of a forgotten tragedy that had once befallen Cedar Hollow. The puppet, in its grotesque grace, danced through tales of fires that devoured whole families, of mysterious vanishings never solved, and of a devastating flood that had almost wiped the town from the face of the earth. The man and his puppet unveiled the town's buried secrets, each more horrifying than the last. As they did, strange events started to plague Cedar Hollow. Old wounds seemed to reopen, events of the past replaying with a chilling precision. The Johnson farmhouse, once a symbol of prosperous farming, caught fire one eerie night, 
just like it had a century ago. The eeriest part? No one lived there, and there were no signs of arson. The blaze extinguished itself, leaving behind the charred skeleton of the farmhouse. Days later, young Mary Abernathy disappeared, much like her ancestor who vanished under the same apple tree, her empty swing swaying in the ominous moonlight. She was found unharmed the next morning, with no recollection of the night before, her eyes haunted. When the night of the Great Flood story came, the river swelled and roared, flooding the lower part of the town. It receded by morning, leaving behind a damp reminder of the catastrophe once endured. Fear hung in the air of Cedar Hollow like a thick fog, the residents too petrified to confront the suited man, their distress mirrored in their haggard faces. The town that was once bound by a shared history was now being torn apart by it. One night, overcome by the relentless terror, the town's eldest resident, Agnes Doyle, decided to intervene. Armed with determination, she walked to the field, interrupting the latest chilling tale. Her heart pounded in her chest as she faced the man and his spectral puppet, their silhouettes a grim tableau against the moonlit field. Why are you doing this? What do you want from us? She demanded, her voice shaky yet resolute. The man was silent for a long moment before he spoke, his voice a rustle like wind through the wheat. To remember, he said. This town has forgotten its past. In doing so, it has forgotten its lessons. These strings of the past must not be severed. And who are you to decide that? Agnes shot back. I am a storyteller, he replied simply. And stories, even the most painful, demand to be told. Only then can healing occur. Only then can the past rest. As Agnes looked into the puppet's hollow eyes, she felt a chill crawl up her spine. She realized that each act of horror had brought the townsfolk together, each tragedy a string connecting them, pulling them from their stagnation, forcing them to face their shared history, to learn and to heal. From that night, the full moon brought less fear and more understanding. The man's puppet wove tales of pain, loss, and ultimately, survival. The past was no longer a haunting specter but a testament to their resilience. As the puppet danced under the moon, the town of Cedar Hollow learnt to confront its past, the strings of shared tragedies binding them closer in shared resilience. They were no longer just spectators to the puppet's tale. They were active participants in their living history, finding in the old tragedies a newfound strength to face whatever the future might hold. And as the past healed, the strange events ceased, leaving behind a stronger, braver town. In the end, the man in the suit and his eerie puppet did not bring horror to Cedar Hollow, but rather a chilling reminder of their forgotten past. His shows, terrifying yet cathartic, reminded them that they were bound by more than just land. They were tied together by the strings of the past, a past that was filled with both horror and heroism, tragedy and triumph. The Soul Seer the village of Whitestone, nestled in the heart of Victorian England, was a picturesque sight, draped in velvety silence. At the northern edge sat a mansion, as weathered as the rocks upon the shore, where the enigmatic Rosalind resided. Her inky hair and eyes, stark against her porcelain skin, and her ageless beauty painted her in the colors of the supernatural. Rosalind was rumored to be a vampire. Her nightly sojourns and solitary existence only fanned the flames of these stories. But the villagers, with their pitchforks and superstition, were wrong. She was not a vampire, but a soul seer. An ability she did not ask for, a power that left her sleepless, and a curse she desperately sought to rid herself of. Her evenings were spent on self-imposed isolation, wandering the grounds of her mansion, her only company the wind whispering stories to the ancient oaks. She was afraid. Not of the dark, but of the souls she could see. The blackened and corrupt hearts hidden behind warm smiles, the sins shrouded under pious exteriors. A villager named Oliver, renowned for his kindness, had a soul blacker than a moonless night. She saw him cheating his friends and tormenting his wife. In young Amelia, who was loved by all for her innocence, she saw petty thefts and cruel words uttered in hushed voices. The more she saw, the more she recoiled. One night, amid her struggle with the haunting ability, she found the village ablaze with torches, a mob marching towards her home. 
They feared her, thought her to be a supernatural threat. Fear and ignorance, she thought, were indeed potent fuel for hatred. Rosalind prepared herself for the confrontation. She could not escape. She was a prisoner of her abilities and their misconceptions. She stepped onto her porch, her figure silhouetted against the moonlight, her eyes mirroring the darkness within the mob's souls. The crowd halted at the sight of her. The murmuring ceased, and all that could be heard was the cracking of torches. Rosalind took a deep breath, embracing the terror within. She looked straight into their eyes, their souls laid bare to her gaze. I am no vampire, she began, her voice echoing in the quiet night, but a seer. A seer of your truths, of your sins and your darkest desires. The crowd recoiled, whispers turning into shouts. Fear morphed into anger. But Rosalind continued, her voice calm yet stern. I am not your enemy. You are your own. One by one, she revealed their transgressions, their faucets echoing in the silent night, the crowd's courage faltering with each revelation. The once united mob started to fracture, each wary of the other, their secrets stripped bare. Suddenly, an arrow sliced through the chilly air, aimed straight at Rosalind. But before it could reach her, it halted mid-air, falling harmlessly to the ground. The mob gasped. Rosalind merely sighed, her gaze unblinking. I am not your doom. I am your mirror, she declared, her voice resonating with an unfathomable power. I see the darkness you try to hide. I am not the monster here. As the last word echoed, the villagers dispersed, leaving Rosalind alone in the eerie silence of the night. They carried with them not only their exposed secrets but a newfound fear of their hidden selves. That night, the villagers learned the truth about Rosalind, but they also discovered the darkness within themselves. And in their hearts, they knew who the real monsters were. In the wake of their confrontation, Rosalind stood alone, a haunting figure against the backdrop of the moonlit mansion. The soul seer had revealed their true selves, the reality far more frightening than any vampire tale. As for Rosalind, her battle continued, her ability a constant torment. But she held on, hoping one day to find solace from the shadows she saw, in a world that feared its own reflection. Thank you for watching, and remember the darkness awaits. Until our paths cross again, stay fearful and stay subscribed.